Some even volunteer to make a presentation to help every community understand economic crisis, the government policy matrix, and then uh, uh, they spend so much time to prepare this presentation. And I thought probably three or four students uh, would uh, volunteer to do, but eventually only two, that's okay. Those two are very good business students. I remember in the semester, uh, I wrote one word on the board, P-I-G-S, and then I asked the students. And many of them just stare at me, what do you talk about the pigs? And then few students, they could say, pigs stand for what? Portugal, Italy, uh, and G, Greece, Spain, if you include uh, Ireland, that would be double I. Uh, those are few students, uh, including the presenters right here. Another occasion, uh, I talked to the student uh, who is from Brazil. I said, you know the real problem in Brazil? The student could answer very easily because uh, Real is the name of Brazil's currency because uh, real went up about 35% in just uh, one year, causing too many problems to the companies in Brazil. So the student could update a lot of information about uh, Brazil's economy. That's a child right here. So those are two students, are very unusual. It's hard to get the students interested in economics. So I'm happy to have those two students willing to share with you what they learn, what they can tell you about economic crisis in this country, in <coughs> Europe. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me to welcome presenters Charles and Billy. Thank you, Dr. Tai, for the warm introduction. and. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming also. Uh, this is our first presentation for a large group, but we're really prepared and we're really excited of being here also. So the 2007 economic crisis, it, it's still affecting us now, and in order for us to have an understanding of what happened in 2007, we have to go back a little further so we can understand what was going on. So we start with the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble popped around the year 2000 and the dot-com bubble was inflated when investors were investing heavily on the internet companies. They expected those companies to have like a high return of like profits and revenues, but the fact is that those companies failed to deliver those returns and as you can see, it just peaked at 5,048 in March 2000, and then it dropped virtually. Together with that, we have the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which didn't help the economy much either. Totally, on this crisis, $5 trillion just vanished in thin air. So. so the Federal Reserve steps in and lowers the federal funds rate. This is a very important rate uh, because it's a benchmark for banks and banks lend money overnight to other banks to achieve uh, a minimum balance that they are required to have. So by having a lower federal funds rate, the Federal Reserve entice banks to try to lend more. So, just a second please. I hope you can hear me better now. Okay, so in 2004, the Federal Reserve Bank steps up the, the federal funds rate again, and they did so in order to slow down the growth of the housing market that was over-accelerated. We do want growth, but we want at a constant pace, not too fast. So 
After the dot-com bubble, investors were really skeptical about the stock market and they, they were seeing housing investment as a very safe investment. As you can see, from first quarter in 2002 to the last quarter of 2005, overall growth in the new home sales was above 30%, which is a really strong growth for a housing market. And as a result of the increase in demand for houses, the prices of houses were also constantly on the rise. The red line in the bottom represents months of supply. Months of supply is the ratio of houses for sale over houses sold. So pretty much represents inventory in months of houses. <coughs> so the, this is an adjusted rate mortgage and it tends to follow the federal funds rate so as you can see because of the federal funds rate drop before 2004 it entices consumers to get a mortgage and buy a house what a lower federal what a lower army mortgage does is that it lowers your monthly payments so now in 2004 homeowners could afford the payment of a house but as the interest rate grew up, for instance, if a homeowner got a loan in 2004, by mid-2006, your monthly payments would be over 30% higher. So many homeowners were not able to afford their payments anymore, and they start defaulting on their payments. Another reason for uh, the housing bubble to inflate was due to the subprime loans and poor lending practices. By 2006, 11% of all mortgages were either 100% were financed and had little to no documentation on it. Those no documentation loans, they were known as subprime loans, and some of them were known, for instance, as a stated income, stated asset. The applicant for the loan would just write down his income, his asset, and it was pretty much up to the financial institution to check on that data, but they might have not have done that. And another one became known as a ninja loan, and it stands for no income, no job, no asset, but the applicant for the loan had a good credit history, and still the bank would issue him the mortgage. So, So as you can, sorry, backwards. Okay. So after all of this bad, uh, due to the increase of interest rates and the poor lending practices, some homes got foreclosed, and that increased the supply of homes in the market, and therefore decreased the new home sales. Together with that, pros price of housing market dropped and as you can see from 2007 to 2009 the average uh, sale price of homes in the US dropped by over 20 percent together with the house prices homeowners also lost equity from 2006 to 2009 homeowners lost over 50% of their equity. So now you have homeowners that still have a job, but they owe more on their mortgage than their house is really worth. So those homeowners had a high incentive to just default and leave their payments and walk away from the house. That became also a problem. And as you can see in here, from 2005, 15% uh, Less than 15% of the mortgages were delinquent, and by 2009, over 40% of the mortgages were delinquent. The same uh, increase followed up with foreclosures process, which came from around 4% in 2005 to right above 15% in 2009. So, it, the foreclosure process is not good for the bank for the consumers that lose their houses, but on the same time, it's not a good process for the bank either. The bank has the money attached to the mortgage 
and it takes time for it to sell the house and get the money back and be able to resume lending to other consumers. So banks now have a lot of foreclosure to deal with and the foreclosure process is lengthy and also expensive to banks. So banks start with a practice of having one single employee sign from hundreds to even thousands of foreclosure uh, related papers a day. And as you can imagine, they didn't even have time to read anything. They were just signing papers. This episode became known as robo-signing and had the effect of having many mistakes made in the foreclosure process. Uh, you probably heard in the news people that were making their payments in their house just fine and they got their homes foreclosed and other mistakes associated with it. So how did the mortgage defaults and foreclosures really affect the banks? The banks worked with a scheme called mortgage-backed securities. A mortgage-backed security, it's sort of a bundle of loans that the bank does, and then in order to raise capital to be able to lend that money, the bank sells bonds on those, on those uh, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, this also allowed for foreign capital to be invested into the uh, housing market in the US and many banks in Europe and Asia and South America also invested on those mortgage-backed securities. So a AAA bond on that mortgage-backed security means a low-risk, lower-return bond. So the AAA bonds get paid first as the monthly payments come in to the mortgage and then the AAA, the A, B, and the unrated. So down here you have more risk, but more rewards as well. It works very well if everybody's making their payments, but as people start defaulting on those three other scenarios, you can see that uh, the bond holders are not getting paid to an end where so many homeowners were defaulting on their mortgage that even the so-called safe bonds we're not getting paid. And this created big problems to bank, banks because now they're not getting the return on their investment. Uh, foreign investors have the same problem. And it brought banks to suffer from lack of liquidity. Banks lack, lacked uh, cash in hand to be able to loan, to make more loans. So it's important to understand that Bank, banks are a very important part of our economical system. Uh, we do depend a lot on mortgages for uh, private consumers as well as for companies, and it keeps the economy going. So now banks are holding to those mortgage-backed securities. They cannot make money on it, and they don't have money to lend. So pretty much the lending just came to a halt back then. So. The Federal Reserve steps in and one of the first things it did, obviously, as we've seen before, it lowered the federal funds rate. The theoretical effect is that it will entice banks to resume lending, but banks are still skeptical about the economy and they just hold to the little money they have left. Companies were also in trouble. Many companies were... Many companies were still missing and lacking a... Uh, so banks were still in trouble and, and companies as well. So the government issued what it became known as a TARP, Trouble Asset Relief Program, and popularly became known as the bailout of the big companies. GM, Chrysler, Bank of America, Citibank, those are a few of the examples of companies that benefited from the TARP program. And the TARP program consisted of a $700 billion fund that was made available for those companies as a mortgage, as a loan. And those companies would give their asset as a collateral for the, the mortgages. From the $700 billion, a little less than $400 billion was used and most of this money has been repaid already. But still, the TARP program did not have the desired effect of getting the economy going. So 
the Federal Reserve issue uh, what became known as quantitative easing, it's not a common tool for, uh, for central banks to use a quantitative easing method. And what it consists of is that the federal bank bought the mortgage-backed securities from uh, private banks. So what it does, it gives cash to those banks that have their assets tied to the mortgage-backed securities. And in theory, the banks now have the money so they can resume lending to consumers. What really happened is that banks were still skeptical and they did not believe the economy was taking off, so they just sit on the cash and did not resume lending. So the Federal Reserve Bank issued quantitative easing too. This time it has a different approach and what the Fed does, the Fed buys $600 billion in long-term treasury bills and the goal is to lower interest rates in the long run so in theory it would entice consumers to start uh, borrowing money again and buying houses and products as a whole but consumers are aware of the crisis as well and they are not consuming fearing the unknown of the future so most recently uh, the Federal Reserve issued what became known as Operation Twist. And Operation Twist has the same goal as quantitative easing too, which, to, which is lower interest rates in the long run. But now, instead of adding to the balance sheet, all the Federal Reserve is doing is swapping short-term bonds to long-term bonds. So again, the goal is the same, lower interest rates. Uh, for 15, 20 years ahead of us. So after all of this quantitative easing, trillions of dollars of money, has it done anything for job market, for instance? So before we even start discussing this, it's important to understand what government calls a, an unemployed person. For instance, uh, a worker that has been looking for a job for a long time and cannot find a job, Although he's still unemployed, the government takes him out of the employment pool and therefore he's not unemployed anymore and he's not accounted in the official unemployment pool. Another type of workers, for instance, are underemployed workers. College graduates, just graduate, can't find a job, go work for the local grocery store. So according to the government, you're employed, but I'm pretty sure if you're in this position, you might think otherwise. So. Here we have the in blue represented the official unemployment rate and in red we have what we call the U6 rate which is the rate that add those uh, discouraged workers and the underemployed workers. Historically since it has been measured from the, around the year 99-2000 the gap has been from 3 to 4 percent in between those two rates and after the financial crisis we increased this gap to 7.5%. So now we have, in general, more unemployed people, and on top of that, we have more underemployed and discouraged workers as a whole. So the situation is even worse than you might look at it. So I'll be passing on to my colleague, Ville, and he'll be talking about the Eurozone crisis. Uh, if you have any questions about my part of the presentation, I'll be coming back after Vila is done and you can just ask me if you like. Thank you, Charles. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Vila and I'll try to explain what is going on in Europe at the moment. Those of you who have been following the news might be aware that we have a crisis in Europe. And in the middle of this crisis, there is one country, Greece. Uh, and this sort of raises the question, how can a single country of 10 million people drive the entire continent into a crisis? Well, the reason for this is the Eurozone. Eurozone is an economical and monetary union which was established in 1999. Then in 2002, uh, Eurozone started to use common currency, Euro. Uh, and by now, Euro is being used by 17 countries, Greece included. 
furthermore, those countries that are part of the European Union but are not part of the Euro are still committed to the economical policies of Eurozone. So the crisis in Europe is called the Eurozone debt crisis. And I try to explain what is a debt crisis and how did Europe end up in this situation. First, let's develop a model. Number one, sovereign state acquires a large debt. Sovereign state meaning a territory which has a permanent population, government, and is capable of entering into relationship with other states. When this debt is acquired, concerns start to arise. Uh, is the state able to pay back the debt? Meaning, is the debt sustainable? Can the state make its payments? And when the, these concerns rise, investors require a higher interest rate, meaning they need a bigger compensation for taking the risk of subscribing into the public debt. And this increases the risk of insolvency, meaning that the country <coughs> cannot make the interest and the capital payments, leaving the only option being defaulting on the debt. So how did Eurozone end up in a debt crisis? Most of the causes can be traced back to the US financial crisis. And like Charles said, European banks were big investors in US markets, which resulted when the housing market crashed, European banks ended up in troubles. This meant that European countries were forced to bail out their banks. Also, the countries were forced to use fiscal and monetary policies to, pre to prevent and to reduce uh, the financial crisis in Europe. All this prevention was really expensive and countries were forced to take on new debt. And some countries in Europe already had significant levels of debt and when they took on a new debt they developed a really huge level of debt this is when we come to the peaks like dr tai mentioned earlier peaks is a term used to describe the economies of portugal italy ireland greece and spain uh, and these five countries are the trouble of five they are the ones with a high level of debt they are causing all these problems in eurozone the chart that you see here on the bottom is the debt as a percentage of GDP. And as you can see, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, they are all topping this chart. But let's keep up with Greece and see what happened in Greece and what's going on in Greece. This is the same chart, debt as a percentage of GDP. Greece's economy was actually the fastest growing economy from 2000 until 2007. But to keep up with this growth, Greece was forced to run a large deficit on their public sector, which resulted this level 100% uh, debt as a percentage of GDP ratio. And when you look at this chart, and you see the Eurozone average being around here and Greece being here, you might start to wonder, why would Eurozone accept this troubled country into their monetary and economical union? Well, as it was found out, Greece was hiding its actual level of debt. It was found out in the early part of 2010 that it had been paying hundreds of millions of dollars to Goldman Sachs and other banks to hide uh, paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fees to hide the actual level of borrow in order to meet the monetary union guidelines. So let's get back to the model. Uh, number one, sovereign state acquires a large debt. And when the actual level of borrowing is revealed, concerns arise. Is Greece able to pay back all this debt? This would lead us to number three, investors require, require a higher interest rate. And as we see here, here when it's revealed that the actual level of borrowing is way higher than anybody had expected, the interest rate on a pre-two-year government bond skyrocketed. And what has made the situation even 
worse increase is actually the fact that in the economical downturn of 2007, two largest industry increased, shipping and tourism. The revenues in these industries fell by 15%, which which resulted when the rest of the Eurozone was bouncing back from the uh, financial crisis, Greece was unable to do this. And at this point, Greece had ended up in a situation that something needs to be done. And the first thing to do in Greece's case is to deal with the huge public sector. Austerity measures. Austerity measures are cuts on the public sector. So Greece is decreasing 150,000 jobs in the public sector. They are cutting down wages by 20%. They are cutting pensions. They are cutting social care, social expenses. They are cutting Medicare expenses. And just all aspects of life are being taxed more. So together, these austerity measures and the declining big industries in Greece have resulted high level of unemployment. Greece's unemployment level of 17.5 is significantly higher than the European Union average of 9.6. But what is even more worrying is the unemployment level of young people in Greece. People between 18 to 25 have unemployment level of 43.5%. And this has got the fact that 70% of young adults between 18 and 25 in Greece are applying to a school or a job abroad. And uh, that's quite shocking if you think that 7 out of 10 young adults are trying to leave a country. <coughs> this is basically a catastrophe right now. So, people in Greece feel that it has been the government actions that led the country into this situation. Uh, the corruption of the politicians uh, is what has caused this situation. And uh, rising unemployment level together with lower wages uh, and cut down pensions make it hard for a normal Greek to take care of their families. Also, there's been violent demonstrations for the last year and a half. That's almost daily life right now in Greece. So the situation is quite serious in Greece. But as you might remember, I said earlier, when one Eurozone country ends up in trouble, the rest of the Eurozone is required to help that country. So what has Eurozone done? First, in fall of 2010, a bailout of 110 billion euros was issued. But as we know by now, this bailout did not work. So in July of 2011, another bailout worth 109 billion euros was issued. And just a few weeks ago, uh, private investors agreed on a 50% haircut on a Greek debt. This basically means that 100 billion euros of Greek debt is forgiven. So what is going to happen next? I have two scenarios. First case scenario, Eurozone is unable to save Greece and Greece defaults. This is going to have a huge impact on credibility of Euro. Euro as a currency will depreciate against other currencies. And those of you who have been, uh, who have been taking any economic classes, know that when a US dollar appreciates against other currencies, it's going to have negative effect on US exports. Also, European banks, which are high or big holders of Greek debt, will end up in troubles, quite possibly into a new financial crisis. Also, the rest of the big countries. Uh, investors look at Greece and say, Eurozone was, wasn't able to save Greece. How can they save these countries? And then they start to require a higher interest rate. It takes it back to the model. And that's going to... Also, this will have effect on US consumer spending. Since 
consumers don't have the trust in the economy, they will re reduce spending, uh, which will have a, which will slow down the economic growth of the US. The second option, option scenario is that the bailout saves Greece. The political leaders in Europe seem to think that this new bailout is going to work. And this is mainly because of the haircut and because of the fact that big chunks of, chunks of Greek debt is being pushed into the future. So Greece doesn't have to worry about some of the debt until year 2030. But the thing is, even though even though if we manage to save Greece right now, we still have the rest of the bids. Most people don't know what all this talk has been going on around Greece, that we uh, that Eurozone had been paying 110 billion dollars to both Portugal and Ireland. And just yesterday, Italy's interest rate on 10-year government bonds went over 7%, which has been traditionally the limit when country is issued a bailout. But the thing, the thing about Italy is, Italy is the third largest economy in the Euro, and Eurozone cannot afford to bail out Italy. So, all we can say about Europe at this time is that nothing is certain, and this crisis will keep going for years to come. Thank you, everybody. Any question? My conclusion would be that bailouts don't work. That seems to be, that's, actually, to be honest, that's what I've been looking. I look at Charles' presentation, the giving up bailout didn't do anything. In Europe's case, first bailout didn't work. And as soon as they released the second bailout, they had to come up with something new as well. And now they seem to think that this debt relief, this haircut, and the fact that the debt is being pushed in the future, that this is going to do the tricks that the bailout is, in, is not able to do. Just to complement your answer, I got you, Brian. Uh, it seems to me that what have driven the economies of all around the world so far have been the private sector and the government trying to step in and take over the duties of pretty much the private sector of taking over loans and things like that, still people are uncertain about the future and that does not take care of the, the developments. So, yeah, so far, nobody a lot have done it any better. Yes, yeah. Brian? I was going to say, uh, big stuff, how much uh, of an impact would the debt affect the American uh, market or economy, especially like another country like Italy, for instance, was it being so much price? As you, if you read the news today, uh, just the fact that there's a political turmoil in Italy, the Prime Minister has to resign, and that the interest rate has gone up in Italy, that has grasped not grass, but there's a significant drop in U.S. markets. And uh, yeah, it will have a huge impact on markets all around the world since we live in a global. And especially in Europe, because the Europe block as a, as a block is the largest consumer of uh, U.S. goods. So you can imagine if their economy is in trouble, they won't buy stuff from the U.S. And as Billa said, exports will just go down and no exports, less jobs, and even worse financial situation in the U.S. <laughs> What's it going to take to get uh, unemployment, apparently worldwide, under control? Well, it seems to me that the money just doesn't vanish in the air, right? Most of it is just sitting around, and it seems to me that the lack of confidence from investors and banks, and even people, in their government, the ability of the government to handle problems, it just gives them an uncertainty. So they're just holding on to the money. I believe as soon as we have more serious policies and uh, a more goal-oriented government, then the private sector will start to investing money again into the economy and hopefully will start growing and getting, creating jobs and 
an increase in case, uh, what you actually did not see, uh, the debt as a percentage of GDP, what, when it had been around 100 from 2000, it had been around 90 from 80s. So they basically built up their economy on the fact that they have a huge public sector and huge job markets over there. So now that they're cutting down that, that's gonna decrease the number of jobs. Like, you know. 1997, 1998, Asian economic crisis happened. And then after four or five years, so those Asian countries, the economies they covered and get stronger, but not at this time. After 2007, industrial countries, economic crisis, uh, very different. I think Europe recovered from the financial crisis pretty quickly, and then not all, but these few countries sort of brought the entire Eurozone into a new, new crisis, new, new problem. And this new problem is long-lasting, and it's, <coughs> it can take care of this in a few years. It's going to take years and years to get Greece's economic going. And the same with Ireland, same with uh, Italy, same with Portugal. <coughs> Uh, this is just a different sort of crisis than I think. What impact do you think outsourcing all of our manufacturing jobs to primarily the Asian and Indian countries is, has impacted the unemployment in the developed countries? Well, it certainly has an impact, but if you look like historically, we haven't been outsourcing since 2007. We've been outsourcing since way back then, and what America has, has been able to do before was to come up with new technology, new inventions, and so on. So it always kept a step ahead of the other markets. Uh, now we have more of an operational problem where we are slowing down the development of new products, technology, patents, and so on. So those markets are taking the share of works, and we're not replacing with new jobs. Yeah, like, and the fact is that yeah, U.S. can't compete with uh, non-skilled labor in Asia, so they have to find new markets, uh, new technologies to find uh, new jobs. You, you new industries. The idea is that you can't really compete in price, and in the end, us consumers, we we're the ones that require that. Uh, nobody is willing to pay like $800 on the tennis shoes. I'm not saying it would cost that much, but just would cost more. So we want good products at a cheaper price. So, yeah. Um, what are the consequences for those countries who issue the bailout? Do they have to face any economic cutbacks in the future to be able to compensate the money they just issued to Greece? If it all goes as planned, you know, but if worst case scenario happens that Greece defaults, that's going to impact not only the countries that were in Eurozone and were bailing out Greece, but uh, all the countries in a sense that it's going to slow down the economic growth. Uh, for, for, for how much, I don't know, but definitely slow down the growth. China has a foreign reserve, about $3.3 trillion. So we think uh, those in Northern countries should ask uh, they out from China. Uh, if, if Italy struggle, problems get worse, I think that might be the only solution. If I understand right, that was sort of US solution plus funding from China, right? Yes. So yeah, that's um. Thank you very much.